My name is Tina Tomasic. I come from Pipistro. Um, we should be a bit known in this field of electric airplanes. Actually, I was here first time 10 years ago presenting about the Taurus Electra, which is the first two-seat electric aircraft to fly. It's a motor glider you see there far on the left. And it's uh, interesting to be here 10 years down the road. It's interesting to see what people present and what immense progress has been made. So you may know that uh, we as a company um, also develop different solutions, not just conventional, also powertrains, components of electric powertrains, and VTOLs as of a few years ago. But today's presentation will be more into the sea stall, in the conventional takeoff and landing arena, and this is just a few projects that uh, are public, that we have taken part in, and uh, our dear friend Dr. Kala will be presenting about the hydrogen-powered plane later on after me, I think. So when we speak about MAHEPA, MAHEPA is a continuation of the project that you have most definitely heard about, HIPSTER, a certifiable hybrid electric powertrain for general aviation, and it is a European co-financed project that will um, last for four years, we're now one year in, and the project coordinator is actually here with us, uh, my colleague Igor Perkon. He's the one taking care that the developments are smooth and that the outcomes are as exciting as we want them to be. Uh, the partners under the consortium include a German company, Compact Dynamics, specializing in high-performance electric uh, powertrain components, the German Aerospace Center, DLR, universities of uh, Politecnico di Milano, as well as Technical University Delft in the, in the Netherlands, University of Maribor, and a startup called H2Fly. There's also University of Ulm in Germany, who is specializing in powertrain optimization. So this is basically the group of people who is cooperating in this project to achieve some interesting new things in the field of electric flight. So why are we doing it? Um, if you have read the title, you've seen that the project is about modularity of powertrains. So perhaps not very noticeable, but most projects that have been discussed and flying today in the field of electric flight have highly specialized powertrains, dedicated powertrains, powertrains that were basically tailored to what the vehicle is, comprised sometimes from off-the-shelf components and a combination thereof. Sometimes it was a tailored development for that particular machine to fly. If you take a look at what's happening more in the conventional world, there's the exact opposite. Yeah? Powertrains are a commodity. You call up a producer, there's a catalog, you choose your four-cylinder, six-cylinder, eight-cylinder, how many cylinders you want, yeah? dinosaur, liquid, burning airplane, uh, engines, turbines, what have you. It, this is not the case in electric propulsions or hybrid propulsions, and MAHEPA is an attempt to go into direction of having the powertrain modular and commoditized. But interesting things need to happen before this is achieved. The design space for the aeroplanes of electric kind is, however, much broader than the design space for conventionally reciprocatingly or turbine-powered airplanes. And this has to do with the fact that the power density of the end piece of the powertrain, which is the electric machine driving the propeller, the duct, whatever produces the thrust, is way higher, meaning the component is smaller, lighter, and you can literally put it into interesting places all over the airframe, as you can see by these, by these projects. Uh, the motors can literally be all over the place, and sure, how does then one come up with a one-size-fits-most solution? Uh, a one-size-fits-most solution, according to the project's consortium, will look as a combination of the following modules, which is what the project uh, defines as an innovation and as a path, as a path forward. And in fact, um, these modules are almost technology agnostic, apart from the fact that they move electrons around to achieve thrust in the end. Okay, so if we go left from right, there's energy storage. Today it could be a battery. Tomorrow it could be some potato juice, magic dust uh, in a jar. Just add water, electrons shoot out, I don't know. But 
think of it as a generalized energy storage um, that move electrons out, or that's a feed of some other energy medium that powers the power generation module, which today could be an internal combustion engine, could be a fuel cell, could have its own buffer battery. So on the left side, you have the power generation part, essentially, or the, power, the, the energy storage part. Then the mid piece is something that we call the power management controller delivery module, the PMCD. It's essentially the equivalent of an electrical grid, you know, shifting around power where it needs to go. And of course, it needs to be complemented by what we call for the time being human machine interface. Uh, there's no mention of autonomy in the, the process, at least in the project, but that could as well be replaced by a non human interface in, in, the, in the future. And then we are talking about different thrust generation modules, which again accept electrons and produce thrust. Um, typically, they are comprised from power electronics. Uh, most of the time, these are inverters taking DC power into AC, electric motors, propellers, ducts, what have you. But we, we simply take them as one unit, because one without the other does not convert electrons to thrust. And the idea is to have a universal interface between these components so that not only power is shifted around, but also intelligence is shifting around. It turns out that if you want to have a successful distributed propulsion system, the components need to know what the adjacent components are doing because their performance and their failure modes are highly interdependent. So here is an example of two very different airplanes that will fly under the project scope. Uh, one is a hydrogen fuel cell powered hybrid, and the other one on the right is a more conventional GA type series hybrid powertrain that uses a uh, combustion engine to generate long-term long -term power. Um, the arrangement of modules is different, of course, because there's different needs that these aeroplanes have to fly, but they are all the same modules. So think of it as a, as a mix and match solution. And the real trick is how do you make everything sync together? So the centerpiece, the PMCD, is where we will need to work some clever solutions in order to, to manage these powers, how they go out and about in, in ways so that you can achieve different missions, that you have adequate power, that you are able to carry out your fallback modes and everything that's needed for safe flight. But where is this taking us? This is not about these two aeroplane examples that will fly under the project. And when I say fly, fly. So Hipster was an Iron Bird project where certificability of the powertrain was validated. This is taking it to the next level, new components, new solutions, taking them into flight. And the whole discussion is about scalability and, and how one goes from the current state of the art in electric flight, which are essentially aeroplanes between one and two tons, more or less, uh, between two and six seats, more or less. Uh, some of them are public, some are not. But this is kind of what is flying today with this means of propulsion. So of course, you know, aviation has always been about faster, farther, bigger, more expensive. Electric aviation is also about faster, farther, bigger, less expensive. So we need to take into account the economy of scale and try to capitalize from that. And it turns out that uh, when you look at larger airplanes, like regional airplanes in the order of 20 towards 100 seats even, um, one can absolutely capitalize from the fact of being able to install thrust effectors on different locations across the airframe. This is just one example. What it also turns out is that there is a certain optimum number of uh, propellers that blow the wing in this sense, in this case, um, on a distributed propulsion system. Uh, this is not the optimal number, so don't go into it. But um, what's interesting is that with a power point of around two to 300 kilowatts per unit, so give or take between 350 and 500 horsepower, you can mix and match different configurations really interestingly, also towards much bigger aeroplanes than what we have today. To achieve that, you also need to tackle certificability and maturity of the components. And this is something that for the most part, people kind of tend to close one of their eyes and say, yeah, it's reliable, it's certifiable, 
it's okay. It's the best thing since last year, like when they were talking batteries and motors and this and that. But the fact is that for the time being, there's just two electric motors that are certified for aviation use. Two. And they are both certified for use on motor gliders, which tells a story on its own. A motor glider doesn't need a reliable engine to fly safely, right? So this is the state of the art of certified electric power components. They are just not out there yet. So a lot of things still need to happen. And MAHEPA will elevate this state into certification maturity, meaning that the outcome later on will be certified components that could be, in fact, installed on general aviation class aeroplanes in the same way that we are installing conventional commodity powertrain components right now. So what will be developed under the scope of the project? So the scope of the project is not about taking some components only and putting it on the plane and taking care of the paperwork and looking at the modularity, no. Uh, in fact, the project will result in components newly developed such that they can be used for a variety of purposes, a variety of different airframes and different missions. Uh, this will be demonstrated by flying the exact same components, exact same part numbers, on two very different airframes. One hydrogen powered, one internal combustion engine supported, both hybrids. One is a fast machine, the other one is a long endurance, zero emission aeroplane. So the components named here on the slides will come developed from scratch. Super high density electric motors that are also fault tolerant for mechanical built-in faults. Imagine having a piston engine that can continue to run with a broken crankshaft. How cool would that be? And this is what Mahepa is actually bringing in form of a really cool electric motor execution. Generators, inverters, these are more trivial. Liquid-cooled batteries will fly for the first time under this project. Removing the issues with cold, with hot, improving improving durability and life of the battery, so very interesting things with new materials that have come to availability in the recent years. And of course, advancements of fuel cells. I will leave this topic to Josef later on. Uh, fuel cells are very interesting, and it turns out that not too many of them have flown, and it turns out that by flying fuel cells, one uncovers a lot of areas that need attention, and this is also what MAHEPA will address. The most important part in year three of the project, this will be end of next year and 2020, is flight testing. And flight testing is not about, hey, let's fly and see what they sound like, how much efficiency we can squeeze out of these components. Uh, these flight test campaigns will serve a bigger purpose. They will validate most failure modes out of normal conditions, as well as produce a data set to study much bigger aeroplanes, to study scalability based on using more of similar com components, not scaling them up in size, i.e. not taking a 200 kilowatt motor and making it a one megawatt motor, but rather use five of the same, to see what's possible. By the way, the image here is quite special down bottom right. It's perhaps the only flight test campaign when an electric aeroplane was used to, produce, to provide chase to a hydrogen zero emission aeroplane. So both aeroplanes in formation are zero emission aeroplanes. It happened in the second part of 2016 already. So when we come to scalability, um, the two universities, Milano in Italy and Delft in the Netherlands, will run competing studies because there is advocates of saying Let's use a more conventional approach, like bottom image on the left-hand side. Not a lot of thrust-producing devices, not a lot of propellers, but big components, like megawatt-class electric motors. And there's the other group saying distributed propulsion will save the world and produce the benefits we need for the next generation of regional aeroplanes we all enjoy. So we will actually have an internal competition of designs to have a pragmatic way of finally determining what are the benefits, the advantages and disadvantages of either of the approach based on real data that will be collected during development 
and flight tests. So what we can say almost for certain already now is that future regional airplanes will not be jets. Because if they have props, and perhaps that may look as a, as a way backwards, as a step backwards, but if they have, uh, have props, your airfare, airfares and tickets will be much cheaper, which is what everybody likes. Not to speak about possible advantages of much less noise, emissionless takeoffs and landings, electric taxi, and so forth. What is coming out as an interesting side effect is a design that Pipistrel is pursuing, and that's the case of the 19-seat micro feeder. It's a new term. It's uh, something that really well describes what this aeroplane is all about, and we think that this already today is a viable business case for hybrid electric technology. So this is where we come from. It's the Adriatic Sea, the north part in the center of Europe, and the place on the right-hand side is where Pipistrel build aeroplanes at Gorizia, and Venice is typically where we fly in and out of. Also, when we flew here to this event, Venice is where we flew out of. So if you want to come for a visit, and if you're not interested in airplanes, stay at Venice. The party interested in airplanes, travel east. And you're all welcome. Um, so usually we drive. It's about an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes of a drive. It can get congested, so it's quite unpredictable. There's always some buffer time that we need to take. So usually we leave home about three hours before the actual flight. So two hours on the road, one hour of waiting, and then yuck, you are finally flying. How about taking into account the flying infrastructure that's already there? So it turns out that along the way, there's many unused grass field runways. So these are aero clubs, these are private operated runways, they are between one and 2,000 feet in length. So it's not an airport, it's a strip, okay? But fact is that by DEP, by distributed electric propulsion and some clever design, one could come up with a machine that can utilize all of these and bring passengers to a bigger airport and shorten the journey time by a lot. Not to mention that this kind of a transport would also be about half cheaper than what you get in a car today. Okay? So it has actual prospects that flying would be cheaper than driving. How cool is that? We hope that the Endeavor under Mahepa will also produce some new ideas for near, mid, and long-term scenarios of adopting hybrid electric airplanes. So these are milestones that the project consortium has set up to discuss what could actually be done by 2025, by 2035, and 2050 in a realistic way. And I hope that next year and the year thereafter, we are able to share already what we believe will be possible, also thanks to the newly developed component and the newly adopted ideology of uh, having a fully modular certified powertrain. So if you're more interested in the work, I encourage you to visit the project's website at uh, mahipa.eu, EU as in Europe. And uh, I hope that with this project, Europe takes the edge from the X57. And I wish the X57 all the best, of course. So game on. If you have some questions, I'll happily take them. I've always wondered, ever since you, you designed the airplane that won the Green Flight Challenge, about the choice of the voltage that you choose to run your system. And I have heard stories that 400 volts is, of course, uh, commonly used. 600 volts has advantages in smaller wire sizes. But that as you raise and raise the voltage, you run into physical, irreconcilable breakdown in insulating materials. You've had to probably choose a voltage for Mahepa. Is that something you can reveal? Um, so, fact is that we're still a long ways out of where isolation issues would be such that one cannot overcome them, right? So, uh, yes, the, the NASA Green Flight Challenge uh, airplane was flying at the 400 volt class. Uh, so is the Alpha Electro, the trainer that we are 
shipping to customers. Mahepa will fly in the 550 to 600 volt class, and this is to produce um, some commonality between power training options. So you could grow it also in total output power without producing too much disturbance. What, what it turns out is that the, the issue is not only isolation, that's actually relatively straightforward to sort out until you are at three, three to four, three to four kilovolt class, so three to four thousand volts, 10 times more than what's typically adopted now. Uh, it turns out that uh, disturbance is, um, is an interesting topic since you cannot obviously ground the aeroplane once it's flying. Uh, you cannot carry a, a cable behind it and just uh, try and cancel out uh, the EMI issues with that. So minimizing AC current by elevating voltage is definitely something that helps. So the voltage class for Mahepa was uh, chosen in order to be uh, such that EMI issues are kept under control and that the controller, the components in, elect, in power electronics uh, can be obtained off the shelf. So like power amplification chips and components like that uh, may come from other industries. Um, silicon carbide chips will be used. Uh, so the, the voltage class depends on both of these topics. Uh, but isolation is still not that problematic until you are in a kilovolt class, really. So the reason why the NASA Green Flight Challenge aeroplane flew at 400 volts is because we had no time to develop our own charger and we bought an automotive class charger and that, that thing was operating at 400 volts. So one builds a battery to be compatible with that. So we, we ran out of time. Okay, if there's no other questions, I can take them offline.